Okay. I, uh, I've been living in Selwood since I moved here, and I, and, I, and I just recently moved to the west side, and I, this morning I was in my head, I'm, it only takes me 10 minutes to get here. <laughs> Those stories. So, uh, my name's Gary, I'm one of the teachers here. Uh, Robert's uh, away right now. You get me. Notice, uh, oh, thank <laughs> <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was just, I was just going to say, is there an unpleasant sensation that arises? <laughs> is there a pleasant sensation or is it just uh, neither? Neutral. Just noticing the feeling tone of the body. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So, how many people are here for the first time today? What the heck was that? We have a rattlesnake. <laughs> 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 that was a uh, confusion arose. <laughs> so, uh, welcome. We call this place Portland Insight Meditation Community. And community is such a big thing that we embrace here. You know, there's, there's the practice and, you know, and there's plenty of places you can go to learn uh, secular mindfulness. You know, all the MBSR classes and, and that's great and you'll, you'll feel... Uh, less stress, uh, maybe uh, raised happiness, but there's so much more to it. You know, we are, we are a Buddhist center here, and, and uh, part of uh, this path is embracing community. The fact that we get to practice together, we get to grow together, we get to uh, find comfort and support in each other. So how about turning to maybe a couple people around you and introduce yourselves and offer one thing that made you smile recently? So that's the instruction. Uh, <laughs> it took a second. Thank you, Jim. It's kind of fun to ring that, isn't it? <laughs> Work a mallet. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, for those of you that are uh, new here, um, not to embarrass you or anything, but can I have a show of hands of people that are like really new to meditation? Okay, cool. Well, there's no way to do it wrong. I mean, I suppose, unless not doing it at all. Maybe that's non-practice, is that's another practice? Uh, yeah. So we do what's called insight practice, or uh, mindfulness. And it's really, it's not about getting rid of anything. It's not about clearing our head of all thoughts, which I, I mean, that was a big misconception about meditation. I thought that's what we were supposed to do. Uh, it's not about... 
uh, ridding ourselves of all emotions or, or even the, you know, the sensations in the body. It's, it's meeting whatever arises with kindness, with awareness. So um, practicing with your eyes closed or eyes open, it really doesn't matter. Whatever f- supports you in your practice. I would say there's, there's a lot of teachers these days that just right away say, close your eyes. And for some of us with trauma, it might feel really unsafe to close our eyes. So, you know, really honoring what feels right, what's going to support your practice right now. So just bringing some attention into the body. Just getting the sense of what does this body feel like right now? What's the energy level right now? Not to criticize or to judge, just to notice. What's the quality of the mind right now? Whatever is going on in this body and mind, just start to meet it with kindness, with friendliness. usually like to start most practices with a bit of a body scan. So just starting with bringing some awareness into the muscles in the face. And just unfurrowing the brow. Turning off the cell phones. If the eyes are closed, just having the eyelids gently closed, not pinched shut. And if they're open, maybe just picking a spot on the ground in front of you, resting your gaze in one spot, and then softening your focus a bit. Bringing some awareness to the mouth and the jaw, unclenching the jaw. And just making sure that the lips are soft, not pinched or pursed. Maybe even bringing a half smile to your face like a smiling Buddha statue. Reminding yourself to bring friendliness into the practice. Then we invite awareness into the neck and shoulders. Releasing any tension that we can let go of. Tightness. Dropping the shoulders away from the ears. Check in with the belly. We just soften the belly, all the muscles around the stomach. Just letting it go. And just sending that kind of awareness through the rest of the body. Softening the muscles in the arms and the legs. Really checking in with the hands, making sure the hands aren't balled up in fists, they're not clutching or gripping, fingers aren't interlaced, that the hands are at ease. Same with the feet, just making sure that the toes are uncurled. Just starting to silently offer this body, this mind, some simple phrases of metta, of loving friendliness. So repeating to yourself, 
gently, silently. I am happy. I am well. I am peaceful. I am happy. I am well. I am peaceful. So let's spend a few minutes here just repeating them over and over to yourself, allowing yourself to receive them as much as you can. I am happy. I am well. I am peaceful. time the mind wanders off, we just gently come back to these phrases over and over again. I am happy. I am well. I am peaceful.
So we use this loving kindness, this loving friendliness to, to ground ourselves, to center ourselves. And we start to open our awareness up to the sense door of sound. Noticing hearing. Letting go of the stories, letting go of the judgments. Just noticing sounds with kind awareness. in the room, traffic going by, birds, all just sounds arising and passing. Sounds just happening. Not happening to you, you're not the victim of it. Just sounds. And we start to include awareness to the sense door of sight. Whether your eyes are open or eyes are closed. If your eyes are open, noticing colors, shapes, light, movement. Even with eyes closed, through the eyelids we can see some light. Maybe some colors, some shapes, some visual movement.
including any smells that arise. Sense door of scent of smelling. Sense door of taste. You could be very subtle right now in meditation. Might be a slight taste in the mouth. Expanding our awareness into the whole body, including the sense door of touch. All the sensations that arise in the body. Maybe noticing the points of contact that you're making with the chair, the cushion, the ground. Seeing the body's reaction to the ambient temperature of the room <coughs> on the bare skin or the skin that's clothed. with kind, friendly, non-judgmental awareness, noticing sounds, sights, taste, smell, physical sensations. seen any emotional sensations arising in the body. <coughs> Meditation might be very subtle. Just starting to let go of all points of focus, opening up to all the sense doors, 
Opening up to this whole body. Opening up to boundless awareness. We'll sit for a while with this choiceless awareness. And any time that we get distracted, we get caught up in stories, just gently come back to the body. Maybe repeating some of those metta phrases. And then just letting go again. Back. And practicing with choiceless awareness.
all the sounds, all the sights, smells, tastes, sensations, emotions, all of it just arising and passing within the field of awareness. We don't have to resist, we don't have to cling. Just meet it in all with kind, non judgmental awareness. Each of these things that are arising at the sense doors, every time that we're mindful of it, every time we notice it, that's present moment awareness. The more that we're present in this moment, the less we suffer. So much of our suffering is wrapped up when we ruminate over the past about things that we can't do anything about anymore. We think about it over and over again. 
or pro projecting out into the future all the things that haven't happened yet. The more that we mindfully come back to this moment, these sounds, these sensations, these thoughts, the less that we're dissatisfied, the less that we suffer, the less stress we experience. So we take refuge in this present moment. Take refuge in this practice. We take refuge in each other. We get to do this together. Since we started the practice with metta, maybe we'll end the practice with metta as well. 
So we'll gently come back to these phrases, back to offering these phrases to ourselves. I am happy. I am well. I am peaceful. I am happy. I am well. I am peaceful. happy. I am well. I am peaceful. And we start to open our hearts up and we start to share these phrases with everyone in this room, whether you know their name or not. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be peaceful. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be peaceful. We really start to open our hearts up and we start to send these phrases out, these wishes, these intentions out past the walls of this building, past the roof. Sending them out to all our friends and our family, all the people that make us smile when we think of them people that we care about and the people that care for us. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be peaceful. I love you and I care for you. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be peaceful. And then we start to send these out to all the people that could use some encouragement right now. People that we know are struggling, or people that are sick, people that are feeling less than. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be peaceful. Maybe even send in a little encouragement. I love you, keep going. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be peaceful. And then we just start to blast it out in all directions to all beings everywhere. Not just all people, but all animals of all shapes and sizes, the small, the medium, the large, the weak and the strong, the seen and the unseen, the near and the far. May all beings be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings be peaceful. May each one of us be happy. May we all be well. May all beings, without exception, be peaceful. So I forgot to mention the logistics of the day. For those of you that are new, uh, Jim's going to do some mindful movement, some Qigong with us now. Uh, it's a lot of fun to move in unit. This is riding the waves, riding the waves, <laughs> the rainbow, doing this all together in unison here in the, the floors creaking. I really encourage that. Uh, we'll have some announcements and then there'll be a Dharma talk afterwards and then we'll meet. Uh, we open the the back room up for hospitality. It's just snacks and everything today, right? Yeah, not, not the potluck. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a great day. Here's Jim. So we get in touch with our feet again. <clears throat> I'm ringing. I don't know why. Where's the other microphone? I don't even see it. 
<coughs> anyway, is it pointing towards Israel? Oh, okay. All right, so let's uh, just pour the energy into one leg and feel the response of that side of the body. Then pour the energy into the other leg, noticing the difference between the right and the left side. Then bring our hands in front of us <clears throat> as we breathe in, open the arms. And as we breathe out, sink into the knees. So bringing the mind and the body together into a rhythm. The mind knows that we're breathing. The eyes can see the movement of the hands. There's an inner sense of expansion and opening in the inhale. There's an inner sense of release and relief with the exhale. Then facing the palms down, we'll let the arms just rise up with the inhale, press out to the side, rise up to center, and open. Just balancing the energy left and right. Then we bring the palms together, bring the hands up along the midline, and then press forward and down, kind of balance the energy back and front, up the spine, down the front. Okay, then we're going to take a step towards the street side and extend the foot and extend the arm. And look away from that extended arm and then back up and lift the toe and extend the opposite. So we're on the street side and then inside. The wind in the willow. So we feel this opening in the shoulders. We feel the weight shift back, weight shift forward. The neck turns, kind of loosen the shoulders. Then we'll step towards the trees and extend the foot and the arm. Then when we back off, the toe comes up. Turn towards the middle of the room and then Letting the enjoyment and the pleasant sensations of stretching after we've been still for a while. And then come back to the center. We'll work on the, <coughs> we'll stabilize the leg on the tree side and then run our hands down to the bottom of the sea on a relaxed leg on the street side. And then that becomes your anchor the street side and then relax the other side. So we have stability and fluidity. And the body knows exactly what that feels like. And back to the center. We can pour into our legs again, but this time with the palms facing the same way. 
opening the shoulders, pouring the energy on one side, pouring it back to the other. The fluidity is all through the body. And the name of this is casting the nets, like we're throwing the nets off the side of the boat. And this one, I don't know how to describe in words, so we'll just plunge in here. <coughs> I'm going to turn in a circle and then point and bring my other foot back. So I'm <coughs> turning another circle and pointing. This is the master shows the way. So it's a larger movement than we ordinarily do, but we don't have a full house, so we can get away with it today. So after the master shows the way, then the stubborn child plants its foot. I'm sure there's nobody like that in your family. I have twin granddaughters that are 14. <laughs> A lot of planting of the foot. Okay, open the arms and step back. So we're crossing the midline with one leg and that's you know, stimulating the whole nervous system to integrate across the center. Then we come back to the center and just do the same thing on both sides. So this is a Shibashi routine, it's, it's, it's the number two, and they usually put something calming in the center. This is the middle of the 18 steps. And then we'll part the curtain. So the weight shifts, the arms open, glancing to one side, glancing to the other. Okay, then we'll <coughs> hold the middle fingers. We create two dragons, and the, we'll step towards the street side, and the dragons rise from the sea, and then they plunge back in, and our toe comes up. So it's uh, rising and falling, but our, our wrists are turning. So there's a pumping action from the torso out through the uh, uh, arms into the fingertips as the dragon rises and falls. The twin dragons over here. And then back to the center. <coughs> We'll step towards the street and follow the waves across the bay and towards the yard where the trees are. And again, we use the leg that's on the tree side as an anchor, hold the ball with the same hand as the, the foot that's engaged, the same hand is on top. We lift the other knee and we pass the ball off towards the street. And then we pass the ball off towards the trees. So 
So this is the lion playing with the ball. We have these big paws, we have lots of power, but we're not breaking the ball. We're just handing off the beach ball here. So it's power and gentleness all woven together. And then we get still again, just leaving the feet in one position. We'll open to the side, embrace the energy of the moon, and draw it into the Dantian, this energy center behind the belly button. Opening and drawing in. Okay, then we'll <coughs> let the phoenix rise from the ashes. First on one side, then on the other. So mindful of the mood when you join with the winged ones. Then we come back, just settle into the center for a second. Notice your shoulder blades in a neutral position. And then when we step out towards the street, we'll box both ears, which is a Tai Chi move. But for us in Qigong today, what we're doing is opening the shoulder blades. They're moving away from the spine. And then we come back. And we open the shoulder blade. So we're giving ourselves a little massage near the top of the spine. Keep the neck relaxed and chin relaxed. And come back to the center. Open the palms towards the earth and just draw the energy up from the earth into the palms of your hands. Then we'll reverse the direction. Then open the palms towards the side, draw the energy down from the heavens. And then pause. So how does the body feel? We've taken approximately a hundred deep breaths. And we notice this river of sensation flowing through the whole body. And then we remember the body is not a thing. It's a process. It's constantly changing and shifting. That's not just a theory, we can feel it. So thank you for your patience, your cooperation. It's fun. Good morning, Sangha. And good morning, people out there in TV land. My name is Avi. I'm community coordinator at PIMC. 
and we are about to enact the very ancient ritual of announcements. I am sure in the Buddha's time there were announcements. I'm sure there were potlucks. I don't know, like I don't have any scholarship around Pali to know if there were writings about it. But I do know that you know, the thing blocking the gate would not have been a car and nobody would have read a license plate. It would have been an ox that somebody had to move. So things change, but things also stay the same. So um, there's, there's a bunch of things to talk about. Robert isn't here, so I'm gonna be doing double duty. Some of the things Robert would talk about and some of the things that I would talk about. I wanna talk about the children's program. We are a vibrant, growing, dynamic sangha. We are. We, there is a lot going on here. Robert has been and was the seed crystal that drew all of us to him, but we are the ones that keep dreaming PIMC into existence every single day with our participation. It is our energy, our desire to be here, the way that we seek mindfulness in this place and the teachings in this place that keep us coming back and keep this being a place. And because this is a vibrant, growing community, we have the right space and the right, right, uh, we are in the right place to deal with the fact that there are children in our community. And even though the parents are ultimately responsible for them as a community, we have come to understand that really the entire community must support our child care program for it to be successful for far longer than I have ever been around here, and I've only been around here for two years. Um, there's always been a teacher, and according to people who, who are real long timers here, somehow in the past somebody has always surfaced who wanted to be a teacher, who had the qualifications to be a, a teacher to the children every Sunday morning. And we have had the luxury as a community to not really have to think about it. We have handed that off to some professional, think, thinking, well, they will take care of it for us. And they have, and that's not a problem. But now, because of change, we are now in the position where reality is saying to us, you know, it's time for all of us to be conscious about what's happening with our children in this community. So we're looking for a teacher. We have an interview scheduled toward the end of the month. But until we have a teacher who comes on board, we're gonna have to staff the room with volunteers. We have a sign up on the web page, and that sign up has two slots for each hour. So if you look at the numbers, until we get a teacher, there have to be two parents or, or two people in the room at any given time. And that means that for any given Sunday, we need a minimum of two people, both of whom are willing to work, for, do, do the, work with the kids for two hours, or we need four people, um, you know, with two pairs, each of which are willing to work an hour. That means 16 people in a month. And when a teacher comes, we're no longer going to be able to just put it off on the teacher because we will need an adult volunteer in there with the teacher for, for both hours. So that will mean a minimum of one person for two hours with the teacher, or it will mean two people, one for each hour. And that will mean like a, you know, somewhere in the range of four to eight people when we get a teacher. So the question is, how do we do this? Because, that, because if we leave it just to the parents, it's not gonna work real well. There are, there are parents, but there are not enough of them to really take on that level of responsibility week after week because one of the reasons this program exists is because parents need the Dharma just as much as we do, maybe even more, because they have little human beings that they are training and teaching and caring for so in order for this to be sustainable, I am asking this Sangha, and Robert is asking this Sangha, and all the teachers are asking this Sangha to do something that we have never asked of this Sangha before, which is to collectively have a sense of responsibility for teaching the children in this Sangha and, and making a space for them so that their parents can receive the Dharma and we can know that the kids are happy and safe. 
And to be really frank about it, we've heard from child development people in the Sangha who have let us know that having one person in a room is just not a good practice. Modern, modern uh, rules and regulations and practices surrounding, uh, surrounding child protective services, they say that you've got to have multiple adults when you've got, when you've got a group of kids especially in spiritual communities, because spiritual communities, we tend to think of ourselves as somewhat removed from all of that. And the people in the Sangha who have talked to me have assured me that we are no different than any other community. We have just as much potential to have adults who may abuse kids. So in order to have a childcare program, we have to have at least two adults in the room so that people can double check one another. And we can all know that there is a safety net and we can all know that, that, every, that things are being seen. So here's the way it's gonna work, at least while Robert is away and then Robert you know, will reevaluate. But for the time being, uh, I am, there, there, is a sign up on, on the, there is a sign up on the webpage. If by Saturday, if I'd say by midday Saturday, one of the slots does not have two people in it, even if there's only one person in the slot, I'm going to put out a call to the parents and let them know that for that hour that we just won't be able to keep the children's room open. So in order for me, well, until we get a teacher, in order for the children, children's room to be open for both hours, there's gonna to need to be either two people who stay for both hours, you know, two people who stay for one hour and one person who floats, or there's gonna to need to be two pairs of people. And Saturday afternoon, I or someone will send the word out about whether the children's room is open for both hours or how many hours it is open for. I believe we can do this. I really, in the two years I've been here, I am just so impressed with this community. And I, I love this community. I, I love the mindfulness and the intention. And I believe that we can do this thing where even people who are not parents and even people whose kids are not here are willing to step forward with a sense of community mindedness to help care for this community's kids, to help support the parents and to help make sure that the kids are safe. So I just, I, I love you and I believe in you, and I'm being straight with you, because I believe we can all handle straight talk. That is part of the Dharma, too. So, <laughs> sorry to be such a downer with all of that, but that's part of reality. But let me go on to just sort of the, the goings-on that are happening here, and then um, we, can, we can get to the Dharma talk. So, um, as Robert likes to say, we have the Donna Bowl there, we have the new Donna box attached to the wall back there. Either one of those would be happy to receive your contribution and transform your money into community that, uh, that persists. Um, part of the way in which you can be, feel more a part of this community is to volunteer because there are always things that need to be done and this is with the recognition of the fact that the things that need to be done are just an excuse for us to get to know one another, right? Because when we do things together, we, we chat about our lives and where we're from and what our favorite movies are and we get to know one another and that helps strengthen Sangha. So, volunteer, there is volunteer uh, sign up stuff in the, in the volunteer page on the website. You can contact Kirsten, her contact information is all over the place. I have, I, every week I distribute these little flyers all over the place, her, her email address and her phone number, I believe, I think, I think it's just her email address is here. So contact Kirsten and let her know what you'd like to do and I can help plug you into that. Um, and uh, another way in which um, Let's see, what am I, I sort of lost track of what I was doing here. Um, Donna, sign up, ah, yes, another, I'm sorry. Another way in which you can feel a part of this is there is a sign up sheet back there where you can give us your contact information and we can put you on our mailing list. And that, if, if, if you are somebody who likes being here but you've never really spoken with anybody, at the very least, just put your name on the email list so that you can be informed about what it is we're doing because there is so much that is going on here. There are so many dynamic, knowledgeable people who are putting on events 
to help us grow stronger as, an, as a community and more mindful. Um, let's see. And then after all of this is over, after Gary gives his, his Dharma talk, please join us for hospitality downstairs. We'll have tea and coffee and snacks, and it is a great way to get to know people. I would suspect that every single person here is worth getting to know. I don't know why, but I, I just, I believe that. I have no evidence to that, to, to that fact, but I believe it. And then, um, and then just in terms of, of just what we normally do, just uh, one of our regular things is the transitions project. Your clothing that you don't need goes into that, goes into that chest and it is magically transported by volunteers to uh, the transitions project in Northwest Portland, which helps homeless people get track on their lives. There are these flyers out in front, feel free to grab one. And just to highlight a few things that are coming up, on Friday, March 22nd, Kirsten, our volunteer coordinator, has a musical group called, um, uh, what is it, called The Wild Furs. And they are doing a benefit show for an NVC teacher named Kathy Marchant. Uh, she has a GoFundMe page. She's dealing with an aggressive form of blood cancer, and that's going to be at Ford Food and Drink on Friday, March 22nd, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, our next Engaging the Dharma uh, project will be serving another meal at Jean's Shelter, which is a women's shelter. That's on Sunday, March 31st. Um, details on how to sign up for that and find out more about it are here on this piece of paper. On April 7th, we have a Dharma meeting, uh, or, a, or rather a Sangha meeting. Sangha-wide, it's going to happen in this place and in this space where Robert normally does the group meditation and the Dharma talk. And Robert is going to talk about big changes that are coming and plans that he has for the direction of this community. And I think uh, it would be really great if you were here to hear where this community is going. And then finally, on, April th on Saturday, April 13th, we've got our uh, spring, early spring, Sunday volunteer service work social with, uh, with pizza, um, where we get together and we do some things that need to be doing, stuff out in the yard, stuff in here, which again, is just another great excuse to get to know the wonderful people in this community. So, I wish you all a blessed, sunny spring day. And thank you very much for your mindfulness and your presence. Every time I hear Avi say announcements, I think of the old thing that we used to do at uh, in adventure guides, when the YMCA, somebody would say announcements, we'd all say, announcements, announcements, what a terrible waste of time. A terrible, 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 terrible waste of time. <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> that's what's going on every time you say that. That's not, that's not what I feel. It's just conditioning, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Taking this off the table, because I know I'm going to knock that off. Day. So, uh, I've been threatening this talk for a while. I was gonna, I was gonna do a talk a while back, and um, the, the calendar got messed up, so I put it off. But uh, this is this is one of my favorite Buddhist stories or Buddhist characters. Uh, this guy was named Anguli Mala. That sounds scary, doesn't it? Uh, the story goes uh, this. There was, a, uh, there was a chaplain to the king, and uh, he and his wife had a kid, and this chaplain uh, to the king would offer these horoscopes and give him advice. You know, they're very superstitious people back then. Still are. <laughs> we're very stu superstitious people. <laughs> so uh, these horoscopes were made, you know, for the king. When this chaplain's own son was born, he uh, cast this horoscope, and the horoscope uh, to his dismay, said that this uh, child was going to be a terror. This child was going to be uh, a criminal, and and uh, so uh, to combat that, they named their child uh, Himsika, him, a Himsika, which means the harmless one. And then the parents really uh, taught him to follow all all instruction to uh, to 
to you know do the right thing. You know, they really instilled this in him. And this kid did grow up that way. This kid was very uh, was well behaved and, and and followed the instructions of his parents and and was a, a model citizen and went on to uh, to school to a college. And back then it was the these learned Brahmins would take on these students like their own sons. Uh, would you know take them into their into their homes and you know and instruct them. And uh, 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 Himsika was like the best student. He became he, and he actually became like the teacher's pet, right? He uh, the, the the you know the teacher really uh, uh, bonded to him and and I think even gave him some special privileges, and uh, the other students got really jealous, and so they went to the teacher. They they created this plan, and they thought you know there's no way this 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 kid is so good. He's not making mistakes. Uh, you know, and the other thing is he was really strong. He was big. He was, you know, he was, he was uh, you know, he was like, you know. I have nothing coming to mind that describes. <laughs> um, what, what's, I'm, I'm thinking of Archie comics. What's the, <laughs> like the, 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 um, the quarterback, right? <laughs> you know, good student, uh, strong, all, all that thing. Good looking. So the, these, these other jealous students went to the, the, the Brahmin, the teacher, and, and created this plan. And, they, and they, they actually had this methodical plan. We are going to try and plant these seeds of doubt with our teacher. And so, you know, they, they went to him and they said, hey, you know, uh, Ahimsaka is going to uh, plot, he's plotting against you. He's going to, you know, he's, he's, he's probably going to kill you. He's going to take over your spot. He's going to become a teacher himself. Uh, they, they did this three times. And at first, the teacher was like, no way, this, this, you know, this, I know this kid. This, this kid's my favorite student. He, he is doing the right thing. But this happened so much, it started planting seeds of doubt in his head. And, and he actually became uh, afraid that, uh, that uh, Ahimsaka was going to take his wife and, you know, and kill him and take his place, that, that whole thing. Very uh, dramatic, by the way. Uh, that, you know, when I, when I think of the story too, I think of uh, there's in the story there's there's horror, there's um, there's suspense, there's there's intrigue, and there, there's redemption and freedom. It's uh, it's kind of like the Princess Bride, but not as funny. <laughs> and I was thinking on the way here, I was like, you know, it's not really you know Princess Bride. There's a love story. There's not so much a love story, but you know what? There's there's uh, there's you've fallen in love with truth. You know, and fall in love with this path. So, you know, now, now we're starting to get, you know, a little uh, uh, dramatic, right? So the teacher thinks, you know, I, I, just like the students, I can't do something to a Himsika directly. You know, we're all getting trouble. But, um, you know, how, what's a way that I can uh, get rid of them and, and not have to worry about this anymore? So uh, at the end of the studies, uh, the teacher goes to uh, this, this model student and says, um, and, and this is the practice of the time. Um, your studies are just about over, and now you need to pay me my due. And, and that was just a thing that happened. You know, that, these, that the, the end of their, their this, this study, the, this practice, they had to somehow, uh, they'd get a task or they'd have to repay their teacher in a way. So, so the teacher says, I want you to go out and collect a, a thousand uh, little fingers from the right hand of people. And, um, you know, and Hemsica is like, uh, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and the, and the, the teacher really, and just like really kind of doubled down on, no, this is, you, you have to do this. I've taught you, this is your assignment, this is the way it goes. You have to go out and collect these fingers. And, and um, Hemsica was like, you know, I was told to do what my elders say. And he reluctantly went, and he, and, he, and he went to do this. And, you know, and I guess the teacher's mentality was um, that, you know, in the process of, you know, and, and the instruction was, it wasn't just to go, uh, you know, cut off, you know, find a dead body and cut off fingers. Or, you know, it was to go kill someone and collect a right hand. Look at that kitty peek in the window. We got a little visitor over here. <laughs> So, so, you know, that was the instruction. He had to kill people and collect these fingers. And, and he reluctantly took this task. So he went into this forest. He, you know, he found this little cliff into this, this, they called it like a thieves forest. 
and, and he started this task. And he, he, you know, again, he was, this, he was this big guy. He was a strong guy. It said that he could, um, he could outrun like an ox. He could outrun, I think even later he says something like he could, he could, uh, he could outrun and overtake a elephant, a chariot, uh, a, a horse. So, you know, he's, this is a bad dude. Uh, he, you know, he started out reluctantly, and then he became, because he was such, he did everything to its full extent. He became this very successful murderer, and, um, and, and was so successful at it that he, uh, he cleared out villages. There was, he had, actually, villages were uh, between being, uh, all, you know, the people being killed off, and then just being scared from this, this um, person, uh, they, like, cleared out. And so when, he's, when he started this task and he's killing these people and he's, and he's collecting these fingers, he at first, I think it was, he uh, like put it on a, a fence or something like that and the, the birds started um, picking away at it, you know, as birds eat that stuff. Uh, and, you know, the bones kind of fell away. And so uh, being the industrious, um, smart uh, guy that he is, he's decided um, he's going to collect these fingers. He's going to put them on a necklace around his neck and keep them so he could keep the birds away from, from eating it. So that, that's when he became known as Nguli Mala. Uh, Nguli means finger, Mala means necklace. And so he became this monstrous person that, that struck fear in all, the, all the, the people. And he went on this task of uh, killing people to, to create their fingers, to, do, to, you know, to to get a thousand fingers, like this is this is just this is what he was doing. This was this was his assignment, and uh, the, the the word got out that uh, that Angulimala was uh, you know was was a bad dude and he was a murderer and and you know and killed. And I think it, there was even this line in the in the sutta. There's this this story is kind of taken from the Angulimala sutta and then some other commentaries, uh, and. So in the, I think in the sutta, there's a line that says uh, he would meet groups of like 10, 20, 30 people at a time when they'd, they'd come into his fort, and he would just kill them all off. And so the, the, the word got out about this, this guy, and, uh, a, a, and, you know, and, the, and the word spread out the land. And the word ended up getting back to his parents. And, and they didn't know the name Angulimala, but in hearing the story, they were just like, oh, that sounds like our kid. And the father uh, said, <laughs> the father was like, I disown him. You know, this is, this is not my child. I want nothing to do with him. But the mother, as mothers do, uh, she's like, but he's my boy. I know his heart. You know, I, 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 I want to go try and talk some sense into him. So she went on her way to find him, to talk to him, to try and get him off this path. And at the same time, the Buddha, uh, through his, uh, his, his boundless awareness and, and, and the, his, uh, you know, it said that he had these psychic powers, uh, he, he had realized that somebody, oh, that was the deal. Uh, so the mother went to go speak with Ngulimala and the fact that she was going to go see him in his, in his uh, forest just pretty much meant that she was going to die, that he was going to kill her. And that was the worst thing in, in this, this time period. The worst thing that you could do is, uh, what do they call it, matricide? Matricide? To kill your mother. That's like the worst thing that you could do. Send you in the, the, the worst depths of hell. And so the Buddha thought, you know, I better go talk to this guy. I better, I, better, and I better stop this before it happens. I don't want this person to go to, you know, to, to kill his own mother and do the worst thing possible. And so uh, as the mother was going to Angulimala, then the Buddha kind of appeared. And, and Angulimala at, at first saw the mother and he just said, oh, there's my mom. Eh, I guess I got to kill her. And, uh, and, and this was at the time period where he had killed 999 people. And so he only had one person left. And when his mother first appeared, he was just resolved. I'm going I'm to kill my mother. And then the Buddha appeared, and he thought, oh, great. Here's, and, and, and here's just one guy. And he's not, with, he's not with 30 people. He's not with 20 people. He's not with 10 people. Oh, my luck. There's just one dude that I can kill. And so he went after the Buddha. And, and it said that through these, these uh, 
powers that the Buddha had, and Gulimala went after him with all his might, with his shield, with his sword, and, uh, and the Buddha just walked peacefully. And as much as Gulimala could uh, to, to, to run after him again and again, uh, the, the Buddha just always stayed ahead of him. And it finally got to a point, I'm going to get in the sutta here, where he says this. Uh, he, he finally was just, you know, just, the, just ran out of steam. You know, he was chasing after the Buddha as, as, as much energy as he could. And he finally got to a point, and he says, stop, contemplative one, stop. And uh, the Buddha replies to him, I have stopped in Gulimala, you stop. And so uh, this, is, this is part of the sutta, what Ngulimala says back to um, the Buddha, while walking to contemplative, you say, I have stopped. But when I have stopped, you say, I haven't. I ask you the meaning of this. How have you stopped? I haven't. And so, you know, and it's, it's like this confusion. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I, uh, I haven't stopped. So the Buddha says, I have stopped Ngulimala once and for all, having cast off all violence towards all living beings, you, though, are unrestrained toward beings. That's how I've stopped, and you haven't. And here's a, another commentary on this. The Buddha says, um, I, have, I say that I have stopped because I have given up killing all beings. I have given up ill-treating or harming all living beings. I've cultivated love and patience through meditation. But you, you have not given up killing or ill-treating others, and you have not cultivated love and patience. Therefore, you are the one who has not stopped. And so... Buddha saying this to him, it was like, ding, the light bulb goes off in his head. And he, and, you know, according to the sutta, he, uh, he sees the truth in this. He sees that this is the right path, that, that what this contemplative, this, this monastic, this, this Buddha, what he was doing was the right thing, not this other thing that he was doing. And, he, and, you know, and that's kind of the interesting thing. He was, yes, it was a horrible thing and, and, and you know, taking the lives, but you know, in his mind, he was doing the right thing before because he was told to do that. And now he, now he has somebody come to him and he meets this other person and gives him this other choice of uh, practicing a life of non-harm. And so he, he actually uh, hurled his sword and his weapons over a cliff into a chasm. Very dramatic, right? Not just, just throw them in trash. <laughs> he found a, a, a chasm to throw his, his, uh, his weapons into. And then, he, and then he asked the Buddha, can I become a monk? Can I follow you? And, and the, you know, the Buddha didn't even really have to think about it. He just said, yeah. Uh, there, there was, and I think that was another thing I read in the commentary, that um, for some of the times, the Buddha, there would be like this kind of initiation, there would be this whole thing with bringing on monastics, but with Ngulimala, he just said, come. And, 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 the, and Ngulimala came, and he, and he went, and he started practicing with the Buddha, and uh, you know, and, and as they do in our tradition, the insight tradition now, you know, 2,600 years later, the people that are fully ordained as monks and nuns, they shave their heads, they um, shave their eyebrows. That's another way you can tell a <laughs> Theravadan monastic. They don't have eyebrows. And, um, and they, they, they don uh, very simple robes, and they have uh, an alms bowl. And so they, they, they take these vows, and they live this renunciate life. They live this, they take these vows of living a life of not harm and uh, living dependent on the community. You know, the, the fully ordained, the monks and nuns, they offer their teachings to the community and then the community offers every bit of food that they eat. And that's Robert's alms bowl when he was a, a monk in, in Burma for a period of time. Uh, they, they hold this bowl and the community gives them food. They can't just go to a cabinet and, you know, take out food. They, they are totally dependent on the community. Just as we are still in this, our, this alms bowl, this <laughs> our way of be, you know, being dependent. You know, um, it's a beautiful system, still works. So, uh, and Gulimala took on this practice, and he changed his life. And so at the same time, uh, this whole group of people were just so angry about this thing happening with Ngulimala. They went to the king and they said, King, there's this guy, this, this, this Ngulimala, he's killing people. You need to do something about it. So the king went out and, and it said that he had like 500 horsemen, 500 soldiers, and, they, and he went to go find Ngulimala, and they were going to take care of this. They were going to kill him. And, uh, and as the king did at the time, because the king uh, really appreciated the Buddha and, and was a follower of his teachings, the, the, um, the king and his soldiers went to visit the Buddha, just kind of tell him what was going on. And so when, when they came up, the Buddha said, 
hey king, what, you know, how you doing? Uh, what are you, uh, you having a problem with one of the other kings or one of the, you know, you having a feud with somebody else? And, uh, and the king's like, no man, we're gonna, we're gonna go after this guy named Gulimala. He's horrible, he's killed 999 people. He's cleared out villages. And, and the Buddha says, hey, what would you say if uh, Ngulimala shaved his head and became a monk and uh, renounced his ways and, and, and lived this path that, that, that we practice here, we, we monks? And, uh, and the king says, well, that ain't gonna happen, but you know, if that happens, I'll support him, like, totally. And, and the Buddha says, well, here he is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Gulimala is sitting there in peace, head shaved, beard shaved, got rid of the, the finger, he's not wearing that necklace anymore. And, 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 and at first the king was really was scared because, um, you know, because of what this guy did and they knew you know, he could take out you know, 20, 30, 40 people at a time. He was just like, you know, yikes. But then he, he, he uh, regained his composure when he saw that this guy had renounced his ways. And so, and then he, and then he ended up saying like, well, you know, you're doing the right thing. Stay with the Buddha here. If you, I got, I got robes for you if you want. I got some food for you if you want. And the and the and Gulimala says, no, no, I'm, I'm okay. I, I, you know, I, I have my robes already. I'm, 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 I'm dedicated to this life. So the the king took off, and and Gulimala started this path. And you know, and at first it was really difficult. He was committed to this. And, uh, and, you know, and every time he went to practice meditation, he was just met with all the, just these images of what he had done, you know, the, the, the killing, the murdering, uh, you know, all this stuff is just running in his head. And his, so his practice wasn't really uh, successful. He had, you know, had a hard time with it. And he, uh, he ended up, when he was walking around, he uh, ran into a woman that was giving birth. She was having trouble with childbirth. It was a breech birth. And, of course, you know, back then there was no... You know, they didn't have forceps and epidurals and all that kind of stuff. This was a breach, a breach birth was very difficult. So uh, Ngulimala ended up going to the, the Buddha. And, you know, and also with uh, fully ordained monastics, they can't touch, uh, like the monks can't touch women and the women can't touch men. You know, they lead these renunciates lives where they separate themselves from, from that um, desire. So he went to the Buddha and he's like, ah, I don't know what to do. And uh, the Buddha told him, Let me get the line right. Uh, the Buddhist said to that, uh, uh, he said, what you can do is go to her and say, sister, since I was born, I do not recall intentionally killing a living being. Through this truth, may there be well-being for you, well-being for your fetus. So there's this blessing. And Ngulimala's like, uh, I can't really say that. I've killed a lot of people. And the Buddha's like, oh yeah, that's right. So what, what you can say uh, is, um, Sister, since I was born into this noble birth, meaning, you know, since I changed my life and became a monk and, and living this life of non-harm, I do not recall intentionally killing a living being. Through this truth, may there be well-being for you, well-being for your fetus. And so, uh, so he's like, all right, I'll give it a try. And he went and he, and he offered this blessing to this woman and she had uh, a successful birth. The, the baby was born safely and, and, and it was all good. And uh, the word got out uh, that uh, that this guy, this Ngulimala, and you know, and previous to this, when he was, uh, you know, he had he didn't have a successful uh, practice because of all these images in his head. He still had all this resentment. He still had all these stories going on. And also, when he went around to the villages, there was the the families of the people that he murdered there. And so that they, you know, they threw rocks at him. They wouldn't give him food e even. You know, it was very it was a very difficult existence. And. Um, you know, and, and in one time he went to the Buddha and he asked the Buddha that, and the, and the Buddha just said, bear it. This is your karma. You know, that you've done these things. Yes, you've lived this life, commit to this life, but you still need to deal with the repercussions of this. And so, so this, there's this going on, and then he offered this blessing to this woman, and she had a successful birth, and, then, and so then she saw, like, yeah, Ngulimala really changed his ways. And then the word got out that he helped this woman, and this baby was born, and, and the villagers started uh, looking at him in a different light, and they started um, uh, feeding him, and it, was, and it made his existence better, and he started to uh, change his relationship with himself. He was able, through these actions, he was able to see, like, oh, you know, maybe I'm not so bad. 
Maybe I can, maybe I can through my actions, change this, uh, my relationship to the world and, and to myself. And so his practice uh, deepened. He, he, he began to unburden himself with all this stuff that he carried around. He began to forgive himself. And, he, uh, and ultimately, he uh, attained liberation. He attained enlightenment. And, um, you know, he's still, even being a liberated being, even being enlightened, he still sometimes dealt with, uh, with, with people that uh, beat him mercil- mercilessly and threw stuff at him. And, and, uh, and there was, I think there was one time that uh, uh, he, he went into the... Um, you know, went, went into the village with his alms bowl, and, and people just threw a bunch of rocks at him. They split his head open. They broke his bowl, and uh, and he and he went back to the Buddha, and uh, and he and he and he just and he was just accepting it. He didn't fight back. He did. He wasn't angry. He wasn't uh, uh, remorse. Or he wasn't regretful. He went to the Buddha and he said, "Who once was heedless, but later is not, brightens the world like a moon set free from a cloud. His evil done deeds is replaced with skillfulness." He brightens the world like a moon set free from a cloud. And then even has this reflection, he's talking about his, you know, my, my enemies, you know, these people that have hit me, these, these people that have, uh, you know, and, and rightly so, you know, I, I hurt their, you know, I killed their families. May even my enemies hear talk of the Dhamma, even my enemies, may even my enemies devote themselves to the Buddha's bidding. May even my enemies associate with those people who are peaceful, good, Get others to accept the Dhamma. May even my enemies hear the Dhamma time and again from those who advise endurance, forbearance, who praise non-opposition, and may they follow it. So he ended up, um, there's, there's, there's a couple different things. He may have just died naturally, or he may have been, he may have been um, killed by these villagers. But uh, whatever the case is, he died uh, he died unconfused. He died, he died free. And after he died, um, some of the monks kind of asked the Buddha about it, and, and, the, and the Buddha's like, he actually died as an arahant, fully enlightened. He, he gets to es- escape this life of, uh, of uh, uh, life and death and rebirth. He's free. And, and, and the monks were shocked at the time, but then they were just, it just really showed them that anybody can realize liberation. And that's what this, you know, this, this story kind of points to and gives us encouragement. Like, you know, if the, the story of the Buddha, oh yeah, he's right by that guy. <laughs> the story of the Buddha, you know, he grew up in this cushy existence and went out and he tried and he practiced all these different uh, aesthetic practices and then he went and he, and he and he's just like, you know, that's not the be all end all. I'm gonna sit it under this tree, I'm not gonna move until I realize liberation. And he, realized liberation. He found freedom. And, and it just kind of gives us that encouragement that, that we have the potential to awaken as well. And, you know, if the Buddha can do it, and if Nguliamala, a serial killer, a murderer, can do it, what are we waiting for? What's holding us back? You know? And I, I think about... I meant to do that earlier. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> if he can turn his life around after this, after this murder, this mayhem, uh, you know, it doesn't matter like what we've done, what our, what our, uh, you know, the burdens that we carry around, our, our trauma, our, um, you know, all the unskillful things that we've done through our lives. We have this potential to awaken. We have this chance to start over again. Over, and that's the, you know, the thing about this moment, you know, the, the present moment, we get to start over again and again and again. And we get to reevaluate. And maybe we had good intentions before, but we still created harm. But you know, through our practice, we get to start to see things clearly more and more and change our ways and start to live more skillfully. And, you know, and that's what this is all path. This is, that's what this path is all about, to realize liberation is these, these, you know, these original teachings of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths. I was trying to figure out something to wear today, and I was like going through the closet, and then, yeah, yeah, I gotta wear this. <laughs> this is from uh, a friend of mine, Wade, uh, on Instagram, uh, Dharma Brigade. He uh, prints Dharma-related t-shirts and stickers and, and um, sweatshirts, and he, he 
offers all the profits uh, towards people going on retreats that can't afford it normally. So it's this, this, this beautiful act of service, right? I, I, and I think I could, I think Wade would be okay with me telling uh, he didn't live the greatest life before, and now he lives a, a life of service, and he helps people. He actually helps a lot of people in, in addiction, and, and he's offering this beautiful service to help people go on retreats. So, you know, in, to, to find this freedom, to realize this re- freedom, to, to realize liberation, we just practice what the Buddha taught. You know, to realize these, these noble truths that he taught. You know, in this life there is dukkha. There's dissatisfaction, there's suffering, there's stress. There's a cause of this suffering, this, this dissatisfaction. It's uh, in clinging. We cling to the good stuff. We want to, we, you know, we, we, we feel all this good stuff, this, this, this pleasure, uh, the, the success, all this stuff. We cling to it. We want it to last forever. And since all things are impermanent, one of the other foundational things of Buddhism, all things are impermanent and it goes away, it shifts, it changes, we suffer. Or we also, we, we cling to the idea that this moment should be anything other than what it is. You know, this, I don't, I don't like these thoughts, I don't like these emotions, I don't like what you're doing, and we suffer. So there's, there's, there's suffering, there's dissatisfaction, there's duke in this world, there's a cause of this. The third noble th- truth is there is relief uh, to be realized from this suffering, from this dissatisfaction, this stress. And the fourth noble truth is the path the way that we practice this. And this is what Angulimala did, this is what the Buddha did, this is what uh, uh, millions of other people through the the ages have done. It's this uh, synergistic path. It's uh, usually shown the Dharma wheel, you know, it's this this wheel that spins. It's not a linear path, it's not something to be done done in order, but it's something to be done all kind of at the same time, and it's synergistic. And so uh, the the wheel is shown with, it looks like a ship's wheel with eight spokes, right? And it's really just broken into three sections. We, uh, We get to uh, train our minds through meditation. We uh, start to live ethically, uh, living this life of non-harm, and we cultivate wisdom. And uh, and and kind of like uh, the beginning of the story with Angulimala, if we just practice meditation and we don't clean up our act, if we don't really start to meet all these these resentments that we're carrying around, all these stories, all this all this stuff that that plagues us, if we don't do something about that, our practice doesn't get very deep. So we clean up the way that we live, and the clean up, we clean up the way that we, uh, that we hold these things, and our practice deepens. And the more that we, our practice deepens, the more that we see things clearly, and we get to see that, uh, that living this life of non-harm, and to, pra- to practice our minds, we get to experience freedom more and more. And, you know, and it's just this thing that goes on and on. The, 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 more, that, the more cultivation, the more wisdom that we cultivate, the, the more that we kind of clean our acts up and we start to see even the subtle ways that we're causing harm to ourselves and others. And, the, and, the, and again, the more that we do that, the, our, the more our practice deepens. And, and you know, and, and such a, if we're really committed to this path, going on retreat is really important. You know, I know it, we, we have busy lives and, and, and it seems like, you know, it's really hard to do. And, you know, maybe money's an issue. That's the, the beautiful thing about our center here. We're, we, we still run um, totally donation-based, and the retreats that Robert does uh, are donation-based. Most Western Buddhist layperson teachers do not uh, offer uh, donation-only retreats. So that's, uh, that's beautiful, you know. Mo- most are very fee-based. And, um, you know, another option is uh, practicing with uh, monastics in our tradition and in the insight tradition. They still, to this day, they don't handle money at all And um, in monastic retreats. If you, you can watch, you know, at Spirit Rock, they have one or two a year, and there's other places that offer uh, donation-only retreats. Super important for us to, to really deepen our practice, giving, our, giving ourselves a, a chance to, to find some, uh, you know, moments, uh, uh, whether it's days or weeks, to be able to... Uh, to really look clearly within ourselves, to find out those areas of, of uh, you know, the things that we're still clinging to, the things that we can let go of, the, the, the ways that we're still causing harm to ourselves and others. And so, you know, and then, you know, and, and the other big part of this path, so we, we, uh, we, we realize, we see these four noble truths, we see this path, we start living this path, and then, uh, as we do here a lot on, on Sundays, Robert has us sing. He pulls out his guitar and we sing the, the refuges, right? We take, we take refuge in this fact that uh, we all have this, this uh, nature to awaken. We take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. 
we, we take refuge in the fact that uh, we all have this nature to awaken. That term of Buddha just means awakened one, right? We all have that potential. So take com- taking comfort in that, you know, feeling safe with that. We, uh, we take refuge in the Dharma, in the truth, the way things are. That all things are impermanent. There's this thread of dukkha kind of running through everything. And, uh, and we don't need to take it so personally. It's not happening to me. It's just kind of happening, right? So, uh, you know, and, and, and that's even shown in the, in the um, story of, the, of Ungulimala. You know, that, that, that he sees this truth. You know, he sees that, you know, that the, there's this value in living this life of non-harm. And then his practice deepens. And, you know, and, and, he, and he really takes refuge in that. And he, and he changes his life. And so... You know, so there's that part. There's that. It's just great, and there's this potential, and we get to we get to change our lives, and we get to realize this freedom, and there's and there's this balance, right? The Buddha talked about this 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 middle path. It's all about balance. So we get to change our lives, and there's still this responsibility of uh, our past actions, the, the the our past words, our past even our attitudes, our karma, right? So. Uh, I think about a lot about my uh, the the path that I've been on. I don't know if you could tell by the way I look that I've been involved with some shady stuff. <laughs> I haven't lived the best life. I uh, you know I got sober a while back and I and I went into the the twelve step um, world. I went into AA, uh, and when you first get sober and uh, a very common thing, and it's also it's in, in sobriety, but also very common in, in, in this realm. You know, we, we, we get sober, we start, to, we, or we start to practice meditation, and we get this radical shift of awareness, this radical shift of, of, of perception. And, and, we, you know, we, and we clean up our, our hearts change. And so we feel really good, like I'm not causing harm, I'm doing, I'm doing wholesome, pure things. But then we're surrounded by these, maybe we're in a relationship and this person's still really angry at us or resentful at us. And, uh, yeah, and that certainly was my case. Like, I, you know, I cleaned up my act and like, well, why is this person still angry at me? And, it, you know, in, in 12-step, they use this term, uh, the wreckage of our past. You know, we're supposed to meet this, uh, this, this wreckage of our past with acceptance and just, just know this is our karma. You know, this, if we're in a relationship with somebody and, and we clean up, and, and it's, again, this is not just with sobriety, but, you know, with, with, uh, with this path, it feels different within ourselves. We, we, we're thinking different. Our hearts are different. But then there's this wreckage of our past, right? We're, we're, we're in a relationship. Maybe we've caused a lot of harm. We've caused a lot of hurt. Uh, we've, we've caused damage, and so, you know, in the, in the 12-step world, the, the thing that they tell you to do is, is to start to make amends, you know, to really start owning your stuff with these people that, that you're in relationship with, whether it's, whether it's uh, um, romantic, whether it's platonic, whether it's, you know, work relationships, whatever, family members, to go and own your stuff. And, the, and, the, and I found this really helpful in, in our path, too, that, that, you know, the more and more we start to th- see things clearly, the more that we see our responsibility in these things. And so, you know, going to people that, that you know, we're in, we, we have these relations with and to say, like, you know, hey, this is what I've done and I'm really sorry and I'm going to change my ways. Can you forgive me? So there's that, you know, making that amends. Uh, and, and, you know, and also, is, is there a way that I can repay this to you? You know? Uh, um, in some, you know, in, in uh, the 12-step world, they, with some, some things you just can't repay. So they talk about living a life, a, a living amends. You know, just staying on this path, living this life of non-harm, and uh, creating the least amount of wreckage as possible. Holding this responsibility. And so, you know, and that's, this, this, that's what I really like about this, this story with Ngulimala. He, you know, he died an arahant, and he was still dealing with uh, you know, people throwing rocks at him and beating him. And, he, and instead of fighting back, he just met it with total acceptance and like, yeah, I get it, I did this. This is my karma. And so, you know, there's this, there just, you know, finding this balance with this all. 
Like yeah, we, we get to change our lives, we get, to, we get to change our hearts, we get to change our minds, we get to uh, hopefully start uh, creating a, a better environment in, in, in our relations and everything, and then just balance with the fact of, like, yeah, we've, we've done some things that uh, maybe have not been so skillful and we have to deal with them. We can't run away from it. That's, the, that's kind of maybe the, the big difference between uh, some other religions that are out there, and, and, and I, don't, I don't consider Buddhism a religion, but um, I, I just like how reality-based we are. That, you know, we can't just, we can't just do a bunch of prayers we can't just uh, uh, turn it over. We can't just say like, "Oh, I'm done with it," and I'm and I'm all good. You know, you, you hear about I hear about some of those stories of the the old mobsters, right? They they like kill somebody or rob somebody, and they go to their priest and I don't know, do a hundred hail marys and a hundred what is it, our fathers? You know, and and you're and, and they and they would be like, "Okay, I'm all good," and they and then they get to do it again. And this is this we we can't escape this stuff, right? This is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to, it's not, it's not our fault that we've had the trauma that we've had, that maybe we were abused in ways, and we had maybe, uh, and Alice Miller says 99% of us had unhealthy parents. You know, so there's this, 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 this chain of unhealthiness that's passed through generations. But it's our responsibility now to do something about it, that we cultivated this awareness around there. We get to change our lives. We get to change our hearts. We get to practice. We get to cultivate wisdom. We get to live ethically, and we get to do it together. So, if Ngulimala can do it, we can do it. Usually we hear kids. I think there's only maybe two or three kids. No? <laughs> That's the kids. So, uh, before they come out, um, we, we do this little thing, we hold hands, and it's really lovely and all that, but uh, just ending with a kind of a traditional offering of merit. If anything good, anything pure, anything wholesome has arisen out of our practice today, may it be shared with all beings everywhere. May all beings find happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings find freedom. May it be so. Yeah, let's have the kids come out. So uh, we all circle up, we join hands, or maybe if, if holding hands feels really uncomfortable, maybe just touching shoulders. Hello, my friends. So everybody joining hands or just maybe just touching shoulders, whatever feels right. Just bringing some attention into your body. What does it feel like to share this morning with a whole bunch of other people? All showing up to find happiness, to find freedom, to wake up. So giving a little squeeze to the hand on your right, Wishing them well. Thanking them in your heart for sharing this experience today. For being here. Thank you for showing up. May the rest of your day go well. And then give a little squeeze to the person on your left. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your practice. May the rest of your day go well. May you smile and laugh. And then just starting to send it through the rest of the circle, all the other hands, all the other hearts connected. Thank you for being here. And then we'll end with a little song we'll all chant together. Oops, I just turned it off. Do you want to, somebody want to hold it? So we're all together we sing. May, May all, all beings, beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. 
So thank you to our friends on the internet. Thank you to you all. If there's an assignment today, it's to go out and be nice to each other. Oh yeah, blow the candle. One, two, three. Yeah. Thank you.